Uh, thank you, Dr. Om, uh, for joining us. Of course, uh, you guys know Dr. Om. He's got a big presence on uh, Facebook from uh, One Love uh, Pediatrics, and he's also a member of the Governor's uh, Physicians Advisory Group, and we've had him on the show a bunch of times, and I was kind of cruising my uh, Facebook uh, feed, Doc, and I, and I saw uh, your face, and I really had to do a double take because uh, you did a post, uh, and I was reading it, and it said that you had tested negative, but um, that a couple of days ago, you actually had tested positive for COVID-19, and you know, right away, of course, uh, you haven't been on KUAM a bunch of times. I mean, we were just really concerned and, and wanted to uh, reach out to you and make sure you're okay. And then, you know, maybe have you uh, tell your story for our uh, listeners and our viewers. So, uh, Doc, I guess if you could just uh, take it away, uh, take us from the moment of exposure uh, to where we're at uh, now, which it, it looks pretty good, you sitting outside. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, so I, I was exposed um, Tuesday night. Uh, it was a small gathering at a friend's place. You know, nobody was wearing masks, but nobody was symptomatic either. Um, and then Thursday, uh, I found out that one of our friends at the at that evening tested positive. And so then, like, oh, now I'm a, I have a confirmed uh, exposure. So I actually went straight to GMH, um, got tested through Employee Health. Uh, since I'm still a hospitalist there, and I tested negative. So at that point, so, you know, up until Thursday morning, there was, I did not have COVID. Virus probably incubating, but not enough to cause any illness, not nothing that could spread to anybody. Um, so my initial plan was, uh, you know, like, I was probably like four, I wasn't wearing a mask, but it wasn't like we were like hugging or giving high fives or anything. I was probably like, what, four or five feet away from the guy all night for a few hours. So I figured, I'll just wait it out, probably retest myself after uh, five, six days to give the virus time to incubate. And if I test negative, ah, well, then I'm negative. But then, of course, uh, so I was feeling really good about Friday, still nothing, Saturday all day, nothing. And then toward the evening, started feeling a little bit of body aches. Um, and then the chill started. And that's pretty much what I've been having, um, body aches and chills. So, you know, Saturday night, through Sunday night, so that would have been day one for me. That's pretty much what it was. And you know, all I needed was a little bit of Advil, but it was pretty uncomfortable. Not, I don't know if you've ever had true flu before. Um, I've had true flu once in my life, and that was miserable. I couldn't get out of bed for five days. So it wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as that, but it definitely wasn't comfortable. And then uh, last night, really suddenly, um, my sense of taste and smell just kind of dropped out at around 10 o'clock at wow. eight o'clock i had a piece of fruit could taste the grapefruit really easily really it was delicious <laughs> a few couple hours later uh couldn't taste anything <laughs> so that's wow. where i'm at now um i've been getting lots of messages from you know friends patients people in the community have been, uh, been really touched by all that um and yeah, and as of right now, you know, thankfully, my symptoms aren't too bad. I've been, you know, because I isolated myself so early, um, even at home, um, I, you know, made the contact, contact tracing for public health much easier. And of right. course, I advise all my friends who were there that night, and they've been doing the same thing. So we've all been trying to be responsible now that this happened. Doc, how would you describe your symptoms? Uh, would you say they're, you know, low to moderate? Yeah, I would say, you know, at the, well, what I hope is the worst. So like Saturday night through Sunday night, uh, it was, it was annoying. I, I couldn't sleep very well. I kept waking up because of these chills and like low grade temperatures that came through. I never, I never felt like I was burning up. Um, the aches, you know, it was, it was annoying. Uh, not terrible. Uh, one thing I like to do when I get sick before, and this is for any like, you know, viral illness that I tried doing since my years of being a pediatrician. After I feel like I'm starting to get sick, before I feel like I'm getting really sick, I like to do like a pretty, a moderately intense workout right. to try to increase my, uh, my temperature, you know, because fever, our body makes the fever to try to kill off the virus. Um, I haven't really seen any papers on this. There are some papers that show like moderate in, a moderate intensity exercise helps boost up the immune system, but nothing about whether jacking up your um, body temp will kill off the virus any faster. But it's something I like to do. So I did that on, yeah. on Sunday, but I think it kind of backfired on me because I did one of the workouts was an ab workout and 
now it's like, oh, my abs sore because of COVID or is it because of the workout? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's for the workout, though. Most of my bodies yeah. are, are uh, peripheral. Doc, so you know what I, what I want to be careful of is people watching this and saying like, oh, Dr. Rama has COVID. God, he looks great. Look at him. He's sitting outside. He's even, you know, doing sit-ups, right? So <laughs> I, I guess, first of all, tell us uh, what kind of shape you're in. I mean, do you take your vitamins? Uh, because, I mean, uh, knowing you and, and seeing you on Facebook, I know you're an active guy. And, and do you think that had anything to do with, uh, you know, the, the way you've been able to uh, fare against this uh, virus? Uh, absolutely. There are definitely some well-defined uh, risk factors for having a more severe case. Um, a few that are really uh, relevant to this island, obesity, um, big factor for having a more severe case, type 2 diabetes, any heart conditions, really any underlying medical condition. Um, I try to practice what I tell my patients. So, you know, I try to get to the gym a few times a week, um, you know, and try to stay active. I funny that you mentioned vitamins. I do take vitamins. I haven't taken anything special since this. I've been advised. Um, but at this point, I, I think it's a little too late. I'm just going to wait it out. Um, you're right, though, in that I really don't want to downplay COVID. Um, yes, for the majority of cases, it's going to be relatively mild. Um, but that's the thing about what makes it so scary, right? We don't know who that's going to be and who gets to have a mild case and who is going to end up, you know, in the ICU, so. Uh, let's talk about the, the governor now. I, I know you know, well, the whole island uh, does, the governor mm -hmm. positive COVID-19. Just, just what are your uh, thoughts on that? And I, I think it just provides further evidence that, I mean, COVID just doesn't discriminate. Yeah, it absolutely doesn't discriminate. Yeah, when I heard that news last night, um, yeah, I was just oh, so, so worried for her. Um, but from what I understand, you know, she's fairly healthy, doesn't have any underlying medical conditions. Um, so I'm really hopeful that she can pull through it. Definitely, uh, you know, I'm way more worried about her than I am for myself at this point. You know, when you talk about the pre-existing um, medical conditions, Doc, that, uh, you know, people might have that could, uh, you know, be, be, be bad news and how they fare against COVID, what is it about having these pre-existing conditions that creates an environment for COVID to really uh, wreak havoc? Uh, you know, that's a, probably a little, a good question. It's probably way more than I can really get into off the top of my head. But in general, you know, the way COVID damages us, you know, we have direct um, viral attack from the virus. And so the receptors in our body, we have them all over our body. Uh, it's the ACE2 receptor that COVID binds to. So we have a ton in our lungs. Um, we have some in our brain. I think that's what's being blamed for the loss of taste and smell. We have some in our kidneys, our bladder. Um, and so if you have something like, say, type 2 diabetes, all of that is just kind of not optimal, right? And so probably the damage that you sustain from the virus is going to be a little more severe. Um, in addition, when our body starts fighting back with the virus, uh, there, there's it's this thing that's been going around called the cytokine storm. Um, really, it sounds like it's, you know, our body's inflammatory process. And if, you know, people have a condition that's already kind of been damaged by previous years of chronic inflammation, um, you know, I can imagine that would make things a little bit worse. Interestingly, though, the uh, ACE2 receptor is what's theorized right now is one of the reasons why kids are a little better off from COVID. They just don't have as many of these receptors. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thought of why they might be having uh, milder cases. Um, the vast majority of kids will have mild asymptomatic, maybe moderate cases, but very, very few will be end up being hospitalized. Doc, could you talk a little bit about um, the, the, how key timing is in, in getting tested for COVID? So we see like, uh, you know, in your example, you've tested negative a couple of times. And so I'm thinking that uh, people are really holding uh, these tests up as kind of like the COVID-19 holy grail. And, and so when people are exposed and they go get tested and they test negative, um, they might be having a false sense of security, right? And go around and I mean, you know, infect how many other people. So how, and if you could just explain that, how key is it, the timeline for getting tested for COVID if you've been exposed? Yeah, the first thing to know, though, is uh, what kind of test you're getting, right? So you definitely want to get a PCR or the Abbott ID now, which is a molecular test. 
Um, I would definitely advise against the antibody test for um, looking into an acute infection because oftentimes the antibodies take at least a few weeks, um, sometimes even longer. Uh, the ideal time to get tested um, is going to be days five, six, seven after exposure. So, um, so I got exposed Tuesday night. So if I got tested, you know, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, that still might have been a little bit too early. Although by then I had to confirm for other people, maybe, maybe not. Um, but yeah, you want to get tested. You don't want to get tested right when you get exposed because it's probably going to be negative, right? The virus hasn't had time to replicate. Um, but if, but the other thing to remember is that it takes up to 14 days uh, for the virus. It can take that long for the virus to show up. And Dr. Jolene Uggen has definitely told us a couple of stories during our uh, physician advisory group meetings that she's had a patient, that I, I think somebody that showed up like 14 days out and ended up being hospitalized. So just because it takes a little bit longer doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a milder course. Doc, um, going back to the type of test you said you, you think people should be taking, could you just differentiate? Because, you know, honestly, Sabrina is our testing. Uh, she kind of handles all the testing stuff. So if I'm exposed and I go to get tested, do I want to get swabbed or do I want to get a blood test? Oh, you definitely want to get swabbed uh, okay. right now. Um, the blood test, that will give you your antibodies, right? So we have, uh, it checks for two types of antibodies, uh, IgM uh, and IgG. And so the IgM comes out rapidly. Um, and so that's one where if we see it, you know, then we'll say, oh, you probably had a recent infection. Um, and then the IgG comes out a little bit later. The problem is, as of now, there's been really um, conflicting data. And so a lot of these antibody tests, we can't really uh, ascertain the uh, accuracy of it very well. So as of now, it's not something, it, if somebody just wants to do it just to know, I would say, okay, but you know, don't take it as gospel. And right. if you're using it for return to work guidelines or you know, deciding whether or not to let a certain person get back into you know, a group environment, probably not the best test as of now. Uh, Doc, I know that you got some uh, recovering to do. I mean, you kind of look a little clammy out there and you know, I mean, you do yeah. have COVID. So I guess just in, in closing, what would your message be to, to people watching of this um i think i would really like to emphasize that you know just because people don't have symptoms just because it's people that you've been around and feel really comfortable with they could have covid um you know i didn't have really any physical contact with the person i thought i was relatively distant so i still got it um you know i think really wearing the mask um you know that's one thing i didn't do that night you know i was maybe a little too comfortable with my friend you know, wear your mask, keep your some hand sanitizer on you, make sure you keep your distancing. Um, and, you know, we all know what we need to do to stop this. It's just, I think we might have gotten a little comfortable with how well we were doing. And now, right. now that things started opening up and, you know, I was just like everywhere else. I, I mean, I was excited once to see the restaurants open up and I want to get out. But, you know, if we really want to get back to a normal, a lot like uh, New Zealand has, for example, we really need to just stamp this out here first. Because um, the people coming in from off island, you know, we can quarantine them, we can test them, and we're catching them in quarantine. So that system's working. But if we could really stamp it out here first, um, just amongst uh, the locals, you know, it'll go a long way for us to uh, really reopening for real. Thank, thank you for saying that, Doc. And just real quick, uh, with the clinic, I know you've got just a, a ton of people, parents, uh, you've given you support. Uh, if you, you want to run through uh, clinic operations, is it still up and running? When are you going to make a return uh, to the office just for your, your patients out there? Oh, yeah. So the very earliest I could come back uh, for CDC guidelines is 10 days after symptoms um, and at least 24 hours, no fever. I haven't really had any fevers, um, but 10 days of no symptoms, I think clinic that means I'll be back to clinic on the 18th. Um, I still have my staff there, um, and you know, they're doing just nurse-only visits and um, collecting uh, lab results and phone calls. But we're also testing for COVID there too, so you know people need to get tested. They can call over. One love, pediatrics, Doc. Uh, we are definitely uh, giving you one love, and 
uh, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your story with us. And, you know, we're going to add you uh, to our list of people that we're praying for in this uh, pandemic. So thank you, Dr. Ramadan. <laughs> hey, thanks. Appreciate it, Chris. Okay, wash your hands. <laughs> Wear your mask. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Not outside by myself. Right. I got you. <laughs>